Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This time we'll take 30 seconds for a silent Um, first thing on the end is a meeting of note, uh, C1. So on April 17th, 2024, uh, we're going to have a public input night for RSV, RSP boundary study at Garden City High School in the Commons area from 5.30 to 7.30. And all board members may be in attendance. And also on the 18th, on uh, April 18th, 2024, we're going to have a, a second night of public input for RSP study at Garden City High School in the Commons from 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. and all board members can be in attendance. That will move to the approval of the agenda. Mr. President, I move we approve the agenda with the following amendments. D1, additional certified and classified personnel actions for consideration, item number G.3. D2, additional item number I. Uh, three new business. The Board of Education is asked to consider and approve a quote for purchase of custodial equipment, pure ozone state contract in the amount of one hundred four thousand five hundred twenty-six dollars and eighty-six cents. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the agenda with the following amendments. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Okay. We'll move on to public comments tonight. We have uh, several. Um, I appreciate everybody showing up. I appreciate everybody coming to uh, give the board input as we talk about the boundary study. Um, each person will give five. Will get five minutes to speak, and these are in no particular order. They're just in the order that I received them. So we'll start with Molly Evans. Where do you want to go? Okay, mine is very short and sweet. Uh, Molly Evans, I have three kids at Jenny Barker. Um, I'm on the site council, been to all the meetings. I feel like we went really fast from changing boundaries to take closing <laughs> schools, move very quickly. Um, our, it seems like our community is growing very quickly and I feel like closing Four schools is a lot. And then Jenny Barker being one of them, if you would look at their scores, I mean, we are like, num we're number two in the district. So we're doing great things there. And that's all, I just, short and sweet. Thank you. Thanks, Molly. Uh, next up, we have Samantha Payne. <laughs> Hello, my name is Samantha Payne and I'm here to express concerns regarding the proposed plans presented to the community as a result of the Boundary Committee. I'm a parent to two children currently enrolled in 457 with two more to follow in the coming years. Additionally, I'm a former teacher of the district having served for five years before leaving the profession in 2022. My husband Clay is an employee of the City of Garden City. While we are not natives of, the air, of Garden City, we grew up in this area and chose to return to Southwest Kansas to raise our family. When Dr. Dominguez invited me to join the committee, the initial focus was on examining boundary adjustments within our district to address capacity issues arising from the town's growth to the Northeast. Since that phone call and the first meeting on February 1st, the scope of that committee has expanded so significantly. This committee is now being asked to look at grade reconfiguration, consolidation to one middle school, and closing schools. Moving lines at this point feels trivial. Throughout the process, various data points have been presented to aid in decision making. Among these, building utilization stands out as a key metric, with the desired range being set between 75 and 85%. Presently, only Plymouth Elementary meets this criteria, while Jenny Barker operates at 130% capacity and several town elementary schools 
are underutilized by 15% or more. During our initial committee meeting, we addressed several questions and some of this data has been communicated to you. For example, the majority of the committee supported two and three track schools. I understand that one track systems may be impractical in a town our size. It is also essential to highlight this specific question that the um, committee was asked. Could rural area schools be smaller to minimize transportation for students residing in these areas? 76% of the committee endorsed this idea, signaling a clear consensus according to RSP standards. Because of this, when we attended our third meeting and were given the two concepts, the idea of closing country schools entirely came to a shock to myself and others in the room, as well as members of the community. There has not been a complete, well thought out plan that presented that keeps our country schools open. At the most recent meeting, there was a short exercise that we talked through that and what it might look like. However, the information provided seemed cursory in comparison to the other concepts. That was lacking redrawn boundary maps and a detailed examination of building utilization for the schools in town. It appeared more as an afterthought aimed at pacifying those advocating against the closure of country schools. The board has emphasized the need to, to consider fiscal obligations, yet no financial data has been presented to us as a committee. As a member, I feel that we have been placed in an exceedingly challenging position. I cannot lend my support to the proposed concepts in their entirety. While great grade reconfiguration is warranted and the idea of consolidating to one middle school has garnered support, I urge the board to consider caution and thoroughly ass assess repercussions of disrupting over 50% of our students in our district, particularly through the closure of elementary schools. Presently, it feels like we are being pressured into an all or nothing scenario. In 2017, the district was chosen to participate in a Kansas school efficiency audit. A rep from Topeka came and audited our school district seeking ways to improve or increase operational efficiency and improve effectiveness of their financial standing. One way the audit recommended we save money was through the closure of Jenny Barker citing the building's enrollment was declining. Look where we are now, just six years later. At the time, the school board and district administration chose not to pursue the closure of country schools for several reasons. These included concerns about the loss of funding if parents opted to enroll their children elsewhere, recognition of the value parents placed in a rural education offered by these schools, insufficient community support for closures, and anticipated increase in transportation time and costs. <laughs> Additionally, maintaining smaller class sizes was a priority outlined in the district's organizational plan and closing schools would be counterproductive to this objective. Looking ahead, I will have at least one child enrolled in an elementary school for the next decade. I am deeply concerned about the prospect of rushing into a decision that can significantly impact my family and others across the district. I'm urging you to consider the long-term ramifications of your actions and avoid hastily closing schools that should remain open. Thank you for considering my perspective on this matter. I urge you to carefully weigh the implications of any decisions you make for the future of our schools. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Stacy Montgomery. Hi, I'm Stacy Montgomery, and I am a proud parent of a Jenny Barker Bobcat. I currently have one at this school. Next year, I'll have two at the school, and then a few years, all three of my kids will be at Jenny Barker. And we didn't start there. We started at Jenny Wilson. And although that school was wonderful, my husband and I wanted something different for our kids. We grew up in small schools and we um, experienced the value of that and that experience. And we wanted our kids to have the same experience. And I love that USD 457 gives you that option in rural schools. And so we moved out to Jenny Barker. And the main reason was we chose Jenny Barker because of the great reputation it has. We also like the country living. And then we wanted to avoid the intermediate schools. My then first grader, as she was navigating what it was like to live in a new house and go to a new school, one day she came home and said, mom, if we move again, can I still go to Jenny Barker? And I think that speaks volume to the school, the staff and the environment they have created. Um, as we've heard, Jenny Barker also performs very well academically. Um, in the 21 to 22 and 22 to 23 Kansas assessment program reporting, Jenny Barker exceeded USD 457 district in all grade levels, three through six. There were 18 variables in that study that included the grade and the subject. Out of the 18 variables, Jenny Barker did fall nine times to the state, the state scored higher. Six of those nine times, they were within four points or less of the state score. I will admit I am not for the closing of Jenny Barker for the following reasons. One, let's reintroduce boundaries. 
Currently, students attending Jenny Barker come from Pierceville. The boundary is wide. Um, there's also kids coming from city neighborhoods that go to Jenny Barker. And is that the best location for the students? I don't know. And then if Jenny Barker, yes, we are over capacity now, but what happens if we close a school and if our goal is 75 to 85% occupancy, why close a school that is already reaching that occupancy? Number two, the goal is to have occupancy of 75 to 80% per grade school. And let's focus on the schools not reaching that occupancy. As Garden City continues to grow, what happens if we reach that capacity and we've already closed schools? Number three, I believe that people do not realize how many rural students there are in Finney County. And busing those children to the proposed relocation schools drastically increases the amount of time our children will spend on the bus. If the solution is for parents to drop their children off at the school, maybe we reevaluate school start times. Number four, traffic will increase on North Third Street, the highway, and in front of the high school. Is our community prepared for that? I specific, specifically worry about the safety of our buses and families from the rural Finney County crossing at Third Street and the highway area. Number five, the state of Kansas is getting ready to put in a four-lane highway in the Plymouth area. Wheatland Electric and Sunflower Electric already have plans to move power lines. Is USD 457 aware of this? How will this affect Plymouth? Number six, is the community aware? Now this is hearsay, but is the community aware if two middle schools remain open, this will include a $10 million bond. If this is true, I think that information needs to be shared. I, number seven, I am 100% in favor of getting rid of the intermediate schools. I think it's an unnecessary and difficult transition for students. Eight, if closing schools does occur, I hope there's a plan in place for the empty buildings. So in closing, I ask that the boundaries be explored as a solution before schools are closed. Secondly, if schools merging is the answer, I ask that you keep Jenny Barker together and do not separate it throughout the district. I think the transition will be easier for students. Thank you. Yeah, it's a tough one. All right. It's, it's Henningsen. Henningsen. Right. Or Mr. H. Good evening. I am Trevor Henningsen. I am the 5th grade homeroom teacher as well as the 5th and 6th grade math and social studies teacher at Plymouth. Additionally, I serve on the building leadership team, student assistance team, as a student lighthouse team director, and a coordinator for our Leader in Me program. I've also served on district site councils and was part of the original reconfiguration committee. I would like to begin by saying I know the board is in a tough place with many challenging decisions to be made. I appreciate you listening to the community and doing everything you can to make the students in this community, or making sure the students in this community are put into a position to achieve at the highest levels, both in and out of the classroom. Speaking of success, I was asked by our PTO to speak on the academic and other successes we have seen at Plymouth. Our district considers students who score a three or four on the state assessment as being proficient in academic area. According to the school report cards 2023 data from KSDE, Plymouth has 8.79% higher proficiency rate in the state in ELA and scores 15.61% more proficient in math. I can speak of the whole school success, but I feel like a personal reflection of what I see as a teacher as students work their way up to and in my class will give a more in-depth look. My fifth grade class last year was 49.99% of students testing proficient, while the state average for fifth grade was 31.31%, showing our fifth graders were 18.68% more proficient than the state average. In sixth grade, 57.13% of Plymouth students tested proficient compared to 29.91% statewide, this time showing 27.22% more students testing at the proficient level. It shows convincingly when the state trends down, Plymouth trends up. While I'm confident in my ability to teach math, social studies, and social emotional skills, these results have little to do with me as a math teacher, but almost everything to do with our tradition of high expectation and a culture that has been set over several decades. I am personally giving you a formal and open invitation to come to our school at any time over the next couple months to drop in and see the culture and academic success in action. 
can witness our students reviewing their fast bridge and module assessment data to set wildly important goals and lead measures to improve throughout our next school cycle. Come Monday morning when the Student Lighthouse team puts on a student-led assembly and we celebrate classes completing their lead measures to accomplish their wigs, leading to academic success. Come on a Thursday afternoon while we are engaged in leadership packs. Kindergarten through sixth grade students working together side by side on service learning projects, such as designing and making cancer kits for patients at the Heartland Cancer Center and planning a school-wide day of service, planning the Plymouth Legacy Mile. This gives each student an opportunity to find their genius. Speaking of genius, um, stop by any other afternoon and find the fifth and sixth grade students working on individually chosen, planned, and executed genius hour projects. A few examples from the past couple of years are students learning to sew using sewing machines to create lanyards to sell for a fundraiser for the Leave a Legacy Foundation, reaching out to the Emmaus House and learning about local needs to put together a food drive to help out the or to help replenish needed resources. Building a foosball table and cornhole games with the intention of hanging out with their classmates outside of school and planning tutoring sessions and even a student bringing her steers to school and giving an example of what it takes to raise livestock and demonstrating the process of showing at the county and state fair. Come in the morning while our students are walking before school in mixed level grade groups, not because we ask them to, but because they want to. Come witness in the bus line after school when some of our kindergarten students who have struggled with behavior all year run up and jump hug a fifth grader telling them how proud of themselves they were because they made good choices all day long. And then the celebration that follows because our students intentionally look out for one another and want everyone to always give their best no matter what. Take a peek at the anti-bullying video that was made by the high school and listen to how bullying is rarely on the minds of our students because our student relationships and the buy-in to the Leader in Me program. Students perform at their highest levels when they are in charge of their learning and know they have an impact at their school. Our staff has been intentional in making Plymel a student-led school where student and academic leadership success shine through. I also think it says wonders about our school that in a time where Kansas is second in the nation for teachers leaving the profession, we have nearly an entire staff here because of the pride we have in our students and our building. So before considering the retirement of our building, please remember the goal of the Boundary Committee, which is to help the board, administration, and public understand how to make best decisions for the students at the classroom level. I would say our academic success and the culture our school has built is doing this at a high level, and we have the data there to prove it. Thank you for your time. I also have a copy of the KST data that I was mentioning, and some of you have got invitations, but the Student Lighthouse team was putting on a service event, so some of you have invitations as well. Thank you. Next up is Amanda Lee. Good evening. I am Amanda Bergover Lee, and I am here this evening to express my deep concern regarding the proposed closure of Plymel Elementary. I'm a former Plymel Panther myself, a 2004 graduate of Garden City High School, a third generation owner of a Garden City family owned business, and a parent of a child currently attending Plymel with another child planning to begin kindergarten there in the fall. I strongly urge the Board of Education to reconsider the possibility of closing Plymel discussed in the current boundary study process. As a former student of Plymel, I can attest firsthand to the transformative power of the education and experiences offered within its walls. I mean, I'm kind of echo what Mr. H just told you all. Um, the extremely positive experience of being a Plymel student was one of the primary reasons that my husband and I chose to return to Garden City and raise our children here, and specifically in the Plymel boundary. The uniqueness of a rural, family-oriented, one-track school not only provided a strong academic foundation for myself, but also developed the character traits and leadership capacity that have guided me throughout my life. And I'm proud to say that many of those cornerstone characteristics of Plymel that were present in the 90s, they still exist, as Trevor, Mr. H, demonstrated, and are even better, quite frankly, today. I've had the opportunity to sit, also sit on the Boundary Committee since the beginning of February, and have gained a comprehensive understanding of the complex situation the district finds itself in. And while I have been a member of the committee, I do not agree with the direction 
RSP is taking the process. The process, which began as simply adjusting boundary lines to address building capacity concerns, has snowballed into a much greater and more complex conversation. Simply put, I believe this process has become much greater than the district in the current state of education can successfully execute in a way that keeps all students and staff's best interest in mind. Additionally, I recently this afternoon had the opportunity to review the presentation RSP plans to present Wednesday and Thursday evening at the public forums and find the information to be skewed and not fully representative of the committee's process up to this point. One of the primary data points the committee has been given to base recommendations upon has been the use of building utilization numbers across buildings in the district. And it's already been mentioned this evening, but according to page 36 of the information presented by RSP on February 1st, Climel is currently the only building in USD 457 within the ideal utilization range. This indicates that the facility is being efficiently utilized to meet the needs of the students and staff today and projected to continue doing so in the next five years. Closing Plymel would send a message of disinvestment in an already established and well-performing school community. Additionally, it would not only disrupt the educational environment, but also pose a variety of challenges for students and staff who rely on the school's accessibility. The closure of Plymel would have far-reaching consequences for our community. It would disrupt the lives of family and staff forcing them to make difficult decisions in regards to their future in USD 457. Due to the desire for many Plymouth parents to have their children educated in the smaller, more rural environment during the elementary years, I believe many families in the Plymouth boundary would consider taking their children to neighboring districts. And due to the high number of business owners, landowners, and particular family ties to the agricultural industry in the Plymouth boundary, I believe that it is in the best interest of USD 457 and the Garden City community to keep those families in support of the district as a whole. In conclusion, I am in favor of reconfiguring boundaries and assessing the ideal grade configuration for the betterment of all schools. And I believe that the many of the board objectives can be met without having to close a building such as Plymo. I respectfully request that the Board of Education re reconsider that option. By working collaboratively with stakeholders, we can find creative ways to address concerns such as safety, building maintenance, without resulting in the detrimental closure of a building. Thank you for listening to my perspective on this topic. I trust that the elected officials among the Board of Education will carefully evaluate the implications of these decisions and prioritize the best interests of students and community in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're from Rebecca Good evening. My name is Rebecca Swinder. My husband and I have two children at Ply Mill um, at this time. I first want to thank the board and the district staff for your service. I also work in public service and know that you do a difficult job and it's often thankless. So thank you um, for listening to us tonight. Um, Plymouth Elementary, as you see, has a very strong and active parent advocacy group, several of us here tonight in support. We see the significant benefits of our small country school, and we're working hard to improve it as it is. We understand that while our desire to save our existing schools is a very emotional one, your decision will be based primarily on finances and facts. And so I want to address two major sticking points that we continue to hear from the community. The first is school security. Um, following the Uvalde school shooting in May of 22, we decided to take an active and proactive steps to improve school security. We invited Garden City Police Department to do a complete on-site risk assessment to identify the most vulnerable points at Plymel. We then raised private funds and came up with an action plan to improve security. That fall, we met with Dr. Dominguez and several from the school district um, and had really good productive meetings. Our PTO offered to purchase a camera surveillance system, Starlink internet to address unreliable cell service at the school and other emergency response equipment. Right away, we purchased stuff the bleed kits, extra tourniquets for every classroom. We also purchased the Barracuda door locking system, and the teachers and the students have practiced putting those on the classroom doors um, to respond to an emergency. Um, and we also purchased a couple life vac anti choking devices to put in the lunch rooms, understanding that we are further out from emergency. 
um, responders. Our subcommittee also met with local law enforcement, and in response to our request, Climel staff was trained on site with the stop the bleed training and active shooter training. We are ecstatic now to have a school resource officer. She's part time sheriff deputy Crockett, and she is wonderful. Who now splits her time between Plymouth and Jimmy Barker Elementary Schools? We have heard in the list of reasons to close Plymouth that response time is too long in the event of emergency, citing about 15 minutes to get out there. However, emergency responders tell us that the response time is actually about eight minutes in an emergency situation. So, with the training and the resources that we've put in place and, and the relationship we have with first responders, I think we feel pretty comfortable being out there in the country. Climel PTO is grateful for the actions that the district has undertaken to make the improvements within our school and our schools across the district. Um, and with the money that we didn't spend on the camera system, we are able to purchase acoustic panels and some recreational equipment for the school this year. The bottom line is that the partnership between the district and our very active PTO should not go unnoticed. And no problem is insurmountable if you make it a priority. The second thing I want to address that we continue to hear is um, deferred maintenance at Plymouth Elementary, and then I want to provide some funding opportunities that do exist to address it. Plymouth Elementary is a velveteen rabbit at USD 457. The building is well-loved, it's well-worn, but it still has a lot of value to our community, especially the people who are continue to make investments in our community. Most everyone in here knows that work should have been done at Plymouth over the last several years, but it hasn't been done. One, we are aware that, aware that the HVAC system should have been replaced a couple years ago. I think it was on schedule too but instead an in-town school's newer HVAC system was replaced at that time. Two, we are aware that the roof needs significant work. Three, we know the district had planned to replace carpet over the summer, but we're recently learning that the carpet purchase order has probably been canceled in light of school closure discussions. And four, the water well at Plymouth will need to be redug or lowered in the next two years as well. The list at this point seems pretty daunting. We see that, we know it, we know you know it, um, but we counter that the di district has deferred maintenance projects at Plymouth, possibly intentionally, and we're kind of frustrated about it. As a public school district, the board has state funds available to utilize for operation and maintenance costs. These funds could be sufficient to fix up Plymouth if you prioritize these projects. However, I want to publicly highlight a few discretionary funding opportunities, and I'm happy, happy to provide other additional information about this at length outside of the public forum. So I'll go over these very quickly. Um, I know I've sent Dr. Dominguez a little bit of this, but Number one is the EPA-funded KDHE Clean Water State Revolving Fund, which is a program that provides subsidized interest loan program to dig new water wells for public use. Number two is the USDA, or sorry, sorry, the U.S. Department of Energy Renew America Schools, which provides funding directly to school districts for energy efficiency improvements, including installation of new HVAC systems, hot water system, hot water heating, lighting, and power systems. Three is a, another U.S. Department of Energy program called Beyond Grants Federal Funding for School Facilities, which is a non-competitive clean energy tax credit for school districts interested in financing, capital planning, facilities projects, including up to 70% cash reimbursement for new energy systems. And four, if the district is interested in additional security infrastructure training, mental health resources, or law enforcement, then I have uh, federal funding programs to share for that too. So. Whether or not you choose to pursue any of those, we want to point out that the maintenance issue is obviously a, a big sticking point, and we want to help however we can to make those happen. I'm aware that I've covered two small Sorry, topics. Yep, five. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. That's okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Uh, next, we'll speak for uh, Sammy Hunter. <laughs> Hello, I'm Tammy Hunter. I'm a realtor and a lifetime resident of Garden City. My grandchildren are Finney County. My grandchildren are eighth generation Finney County residents as well. Um, I actually have a son who is a current a farmer resident, um, farms north of town. His children go to Jenny Barker. We um, have a son who is moving back to Garden City. He's been gone 10 years, um, continuing his, his education. He, he graduated Garden City High School as well. Um, so he will be moving back with his kids. So next year we'll have a kindergartner, a first grader, a fourth grader, and a pre-kindergartner. So we'll ha I'll have quite a few grandkids in the school district. 
Um, I just kind of wanted to back everybody up in the, I guess, with Jenny Barker and Plymel, I we think it's very important to have the rural schools open. Um, when I heard that they were being shut down or talking about closing them, my heart was broken. I went to Jenny Barker, my sister went to Jenny Barker in the 70s. <laughs> my dad was one of the first classes, or actually the first class to attend Jenny Barker. I think he was an eighth grader. Um, it's just the rural schools are so important to the rural community. To send a kindergartner on a bus who lives 15 miles north or 20 miles south on a bus that long to town to go to school all day long and ride a bus that far out to their home and only get to spend that much time with their family before they have to go to bed at 8 or 8.30 or even sometimes earlier than that, that's not enough time with their family. And being on a farm and having the chores and that type of thing. I mean, when you when you get to be a fifth grader or whatever, you know, I mean, I think you get old enough possibly to go to town. I think I was seventh grader when I went to town, but you know, you're you're mature enough to handle it. But a kindergartner is just it's too young. And I mean, you just don't you just don't have that in you yet. I don't I don't believe. And I I lived it. I did it. And my grandkids are doing it now. And sometimes they're asleep when they get home on the bus. And it's just, you know, and they're going to the rural schools right now. So please think of that. Think of the just their livelihood and their life. And they're just little people. And they're they're a little bit different than the town kids right now. So I don't know. That's just that's just my personal opinion. And two. I've been a realtor for 30 years and people look at the statistics and these are the top two schools in our district and they look at those stats and I've got customers who want to buy in the Ginny Barker and Plymel school system, school schools because of their statistics, because they look at those others and they're like scared to move here and they see Ginny Barker and Plymel statistics and they're like, okay, where can I buy to send my kids to those schools? And I've got a client right now who that's where he's looking because of that. So don't, please don't close those down. I mean, I want to sell some more houses. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good evening. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Tyler Hands, and I'm writing to express concern about the possible closure of the Plymouth Elementary School and other schools in our district. As a parent of three daughters, all of whom either have attended or are currently attending Plymouth, I am worried about the impact this decision could have. As a fifth generation farmer who attended this school, whose dad attended this school, and both uncles attended this school, and also having a wife who I drug out to Garden City teach at that school for 14 years, I know the importance of this country school to our community. Plymouth Elementary has been a part of my family's life for generations, and we have been farming the land around that school for over 100 years. Agriculture is the backbone of this community and our school district's very heartbeat runs right through ag. Closing Plymouth Elementary would have a devastating impact on our community, especially for the children of farm laborers who depend on this school for their education. Closing Plymouth would put these elementary age kids on a bus for far too long. We heard about it at Jenny Barker, it'll happen at Plymouth too. We must preserve our country school and ensure that these children have the access to quality education in the proximity in which they live to prepare them for the future. I believe that we can address these issues of boundary reconfiguration and grade configuration without closing climate. Neglecting the maintenance of certain assets should not be a reason to close a school. 
Rather than shutting one down, let's invest in them to ensure that they remain an essential part of this whole community. I've been privileged to sit on the Boundary Committee and I've been discouraged with the consulting firm, RSP. After reviewing the slides presented to, that will be presented to the community, I do not feel they are fully representative of the information we as a committee have been given to base a decision from. That being said, I am not in support of the presentation. Furthermore, we as committee members we're told during the sessions that will be held later this week, Wednesday and Thursday, we're to help answer questions, but not have opinions. This to me implies we are 100% in favor of the plan that will be presented. I am not in favor of this case. I drastically urge our elected officials, you the school board, to take into account the thoughts and concerns of our community and evaluate all options before making a decision. We have to work together to ensure that our children have access to quality education and that our community continues to thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Megan Ford. Hi, I'm Megan Ford. I'm a teacher at Jenny Barker School, and I'm a parent of three USD 457 students. Cody and Emma are currently in, uh, they currently attend Jenny Barker, and Claire is an eighth grader at Kenneth Henderson. I'm here tonight to be a champion for students in our amazing school community. This is my 18th year teaching. I've taught in a five-track school, two two-track schools, and now one-track school, Jenny Barker. I can tell you that our little one-track school is making a big difference in the lives of kids. I would not transfer back to other buildings if I had a choice. I want you to know that we love our school. We are flourishing and thriving, testing top in our district and home to over 170 students, busting at the seams, actually. We are looking forward to, we were, we were looking forward to a boundary adjustment so that our building would accommodate a more reasonable amount of students as we are over capacity transferring out kids every year. I feel like our school district should be asking the questions. What is Jenny Barker Elementary in St. for Plymouth doing to be so effective and culturally exceptional? Why is it that people are moving to Jenny Barker Boundary in order to send their kids to school there? Why is it that developers and contractors are using Jenny Barker as a selling point in order to sell houses? I understand the benefits of our small country school, both from the perspective of a teacher and a parent. However, I spent some time doing research so that I could bring you some facts. Study after study demonstrates and explains why small schools are effective and make a difference for kids especially low-income and minority students. This is true when considering one versus two middle schools as well. Here are some research-based findings when it, in support of small schools. Um, first, students learn well, often better. Um, Jenny Barker's data supports that. Violence and behavior problems diminish or are reduced. Attendance is higher and dropouts fewer. Extracurricular participation increases. Built-in accountability. We have an internal community among teachers, parents, and students that promotes a culture of caring and rigor second to none. Strong personal bonds. Students feel a greater sense of engagement, belonging, and personal value in small schools. Thus, students are less likely to get lost in a crowd. Parent and community involvement increases. We have an awesome PTO and community support from local businesses and families at Jenny Barker. Improved teacher working conditions and job satisfaction. This is my 18th year teaching. I had no idea how special Jenny Barker was. I didn't even know it existed, actually, probably like most of our community. Um, until I transferred out there 
because it was our neighborhood school. Um, on a side note, with that being said, my family, like others that attend Jenny Barker School, we live north of this school, and it's frustrating to imagine um, having to commute farther than we already do, especially when weather conditions make travel dangerous. There are health implications. Meeting the needs of students, especially those with severe health needs, such as allergies, asthma, diabetes, is something to consider. And let's not forget all the drama with COVID and crowds also that we want to forget. In conclusion, one research article I, I read said, good things come in small packages. I believe this to be true about Jenny Barker School. Transparency is important. Having answers to questions is important. Knowledge is power. And the more our community knows, the less chaos and speculation driven by fear there will be. For me, I would like to know, if our school is going to be closed, what plan is in place to accommodate transportation and road conditions? Is there discussion happening with the city to add a traffic light as we all cross the bypass? Is the county prepared to clear off county roads so that we can all get safely to town. Usually our county roads are not treated the way our city roads are. And this concerns me as an employee and a parent. If our school district is transparent, humble, empathetic, and honest with the community, staff and students, I believe we can all get behind a plan for the benefit and future of our school district. We will be your biggest supporters and advocates. The problem right now is that most of us feel blindsided and uninformed about what has recently transpired. I think we are awesome. We are a unique community. I am from here, I was born and raised, so I know. Um, we want to be seen, heard, and valued. The community of Garden City should not be underestimated or overlooked. I appreciate you, I value you, and I, I love living and working in Garden City. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be Margaret Schultz. I'm Margaret Schultz, and I am an attorney in town, and I have two children currently at Plymouth School and one more that will attend in two years. Um, I was planning to just come and hear everyone talk, but I reviewed the PowerPoint presentation that was posted this afternoon at 30 that's going to be submitted at the public input later this week. And there were a few items on it that were concerning or seemed to be missing from this report. Um, first, the restructuring of the school district seems to be a conclusion that was made, and a company was then hired to reach that conclusion. It doesn't seem to have any consideration for what the community wants, what the board has named as top priorities, or the impact that this will have on our children and families in the community. In that report, it shows that the board named three objectives as their top priorities, the fiscal considerations of operating buildings, student impact, and projected enrollment. There are many comments throughout this packet Stating that financial resources are a very big deal, that we need to take financials into consideration, that there's financial strain on the schools, but there's not a dollar amount on a single thing showing what it costs to run our current schools. Not, there's nothing to show fundraising done at each independent school or the amount of money put into the schools that we are now looking at closing. The student impact. With each of the proposals, there's at least 50 students, 50% 50 of students that will be impacted by moving their school. This will also change the time that they are on transportation, will change their classroom sizes, their teachers, and their principals. It seems student impact has been entirely disregarded. The number utilized for projection of enrollment seems to be incomplete and incorrect. The birth rate only includes Sunny County. Um, disregards the fact that everyone from Holcomb School District comes into Finney County, disregards that we're the only NICU within a three-hour drive that can have children that are born at uh, premature rates, disregards that many people from Finney County go to Lincoln to have their children or get 
sent to Wichita to have their children as I did with all of mine. It disregards the online academy enrollment that is currently there, which went up when COVID occurred and has stayed higher. Is this number gonna go back down and is that enrollment gonna be seen in our um, in-person schools when that happens? And it gives no reason outside of the birth rates that enrollment is going to just decrease. We have 250 jobs coming to Garden City with a new plan, yet project no additional enrollment with those jobs. The packet also indicates this will be ongoing, which is why the public is just hearing about these potential changes. However, it indicates this board is to make a decision in less than a month. This seems to be a way to attempt to appease the pub public without giving us any actual credits or credits to the education and welfare of our children. I would urge the board to ensure they have all the correct and accurate information, as well as all the relevant facts before making any decisions that are going to impact our community for years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Dear members of USD 457, I want to express my gratitude in advance for your time and attention as concerned parents and community members present to you today. My name is Lila Mumgard, a parent to three boys, one whom is currently attending second grade at Plymouth Elementary School, while another will start kindergarten at Plymouth next year. He's currently enrolled at Garfield. Today, I stand before you with a profound sense of urgency regarding the proposed closure of four schools within our community, with particular concern for Plymouth Elementary. As a licensed clinical social worker and mental health therapist, Deeply vested in our community's well being, especially that of our children, I feel compelled to address the potential impact this decision may have on our children's mental health and academic success. Research published in reputable journals consistently underscores the pivotal role that school environments play in shaping children's mental health outcomes, indicating that disruptions to a school or to a child's schooling, particularly moving schools, can have profound and enduring effects on their emotional well-being. In reviewing two articles, one published in the Development and Psychopathology Journal by Cambridge University and another through MacArthur Foundation, a policy research brief, I quickly but intentionally speak upon the potential impacts the closure might cause on our children. Moving and changing schools can heighten the risk of depression in children leaving behind friends in familiar environments and coping with the uncertainty of new settings. These challenges can trigger feelings of anxiety and stress as children navigate different academic and social landscapes and strive to form new relationships. In fact, school move may exert slightly stronger effects on children's cognitive scores than moving homes, impacting their academic performance and learning abilities. Additionally, Sudden school changes can induce feelings of uncertainty and instability. School moves significantly influence a child's development, particularly emotionally, leading to negative emotions such as loneliness, isolation, and difficulty in forming relationships, stable relationships. The research is also showing that the timing of school moves is critical. With moves after the age of six associated with poorer mental health outcomes compared to moves before age six, indicating sensitive periods in a child's development. Furthermore, school closures may exasperate existing stressors and trauma experienced by children, particularly those who view school as a safe haven from other life challenges. Let's not add to that. The loss of a familiar and supportive environment like Plymouth Elementary could intensify these challenges, resulting in heightened feelings of anxiety, social isolation, and disengagement from learning. In addition to the psychological impact on our children, the closure of Plymouth Elementary would have broader implications for our community. Our school serves as more than just an educational institution. It is a cornerstone for our community, fostering a sense of belonging, support, and connection among students and families. In conclusion, I urge you to prioritize the well-being of our children. 
I implore you to reassess the decision to close Climb Hill Elementary School and consider the wealth of research highlighting the importance of maintaining consistent, stable, and supportive envir school environments for our ch children's mental health and academic success. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up is Jackie. Hi again, guys. I'm Jackie Timpson, and most of you know me. Thank you all for taking the time to respond to my email. I do appreciate that. And I know I have five minutes to make a point, and if you know me, you know that's not really an attainable goal, but we'll try. So as you've heard from many of the people tonight, uh, there's a lot more to be considered as we make this these upcoming decisions. And I'm going to leave a lot of those details up to everybody else and maybe, you know, chime in later. But I have been tasked with talking about money and taxes. And so some of the things as have as they have presented tonight is that the data is not being represented well or accurately, I feel. Regarding real estate taxes, after going through the RSM information available online, they mentioned the number of new bills showing peak numbers in 2019 and 2020. The Finney County tax levy sheet for 2018 and 2020 shows a decrease in the USD 457 tax levy amount from 376 million 478,995 in 2018 to 370 million 713,814 in 2020. Those levies are per um, 1,000 valuation. However, in 2023, the Finney County tax levy valuation increases to the USD dollars um, to 461 million 780,970. You're aware that some of this is due to new builds, some is increased property valuation. I think it is very important to note the elementary boundaries where those where the greater um, increases are showing because as it's been mentioned before, that is a driving factor for where we choose to buy and build our homes. These tax dollars also represent more as they are the boosters and the involved parents in USD 457. Another monetary consideration is enrollment. <sighs> oh, my place. In, I, I personally know five families that make up a total of 12 kids that were in the Alta Brown boundaries in the last three years. Some of them moved to Climel boundaries specifically for that reason. Some transferred to Holcomb and still live in that area. Some went out of county entirely, such as to Ingalls and Scott City. Scott City. And this trend will continue if we move forward with proposed boundary changes and closing of schools. Um, I think it's important to consider that as, as we're forcing rural families to travel Many of them that were not opposed to traveling a little farther or even in opposite directions. And I do sympathize with you guys for the decisions that you're having to make right now while simultaneously dealing with the decisions and neglect of previous boards and administration. Um, as I mentioned in my email, as a lifetime resident, like some of the others here, my family has been here over 100 years. Uh, my I found out my great grandparents moved here in a covered wagon. Isn't that crazy? My cousin still farms the ground that they farm set it over 100 years ago. Um, my point in that is that, like me and my family, many of you will still be here to deal with these decisions later on. Um, looking at the concepts, <laughs> we're already dealing with decisions that were previously ignored or mishandled five or even 26 years ago. Um, I think it shows an extreme lack of knowledge. Another, just another real quick, Maggie alluded to this, was the live births versus, versus kindergarten enrollment. Finney County Hospital is the largest in the area. Scott City um, recently announced that they're no longer delivering babies. I, I don't feel like that information was presented fairly and accurately. You have people in Holcomb that are delivering babies. Their kids were never going to go to USD 457. I lived in Scott City when I delivered my daughter. 
I mean, she happened to end up here, but that that happens a lot more than I think that they're they're trying to present here. Um, so I do hope that you guys take the time to find more information, get more input from the community, and allow us to help you in in finding solutions that work for everybody and that we can all live with. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> uh, all right. Before we move on to uh, a couple recognitions, uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody that showed up tonight. We, we as a board value the input of our community, uh, especially from our teachers and our parents. Um, it's a tough decision. There's a lot of things that we got to do in, in front of us, but we appreciate everybody coming and taking time and uh, giving us input as we as we walk through this. So I sure appreciate that. Um, with that, we'll move on to the recognition of the KNEA. Just imagine. Um, okay, hello, some of you know me. Uh, my name is Becca Bernfin. I am a ninth through 12th social studies teacher at Garden City High School. Um, what you have in front of you is a pamphlet from the KNEA. Uh, for those watching who might not know the KNEA, it's the Kansas uh, Educators Association. Um, students have an opportunity every year to do civic engagement activities. That's the back pamphlet. Um, that's straight from the district, I'm sorry, the Kansas website. Um, students need to be actively participating in modern day things that are happening. Um, so just because we might be talking about Martin Luther and the church or um, King James or Elizabeth I, um, we have to compare it to like what is today. Um, some of them are in my U.S. history class. So we start with the Reconstruction Era, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Um, so we spend a lot of time doing social and racial politics and things that are going on in the world. Uh, so the k &E had a opportunity this year to work with your class on a civic engagement project, which allowed them to produce, which if, I think if you look, it's either standard five or six, students have a voice and choice. Um, and so they were prompted that we had to um, think about what are all the social and racial issues that we've talked about this far in the semester. Um, the perfect time in January is some of these students, for example, Athena and, oh, Zara's not here. Um, I don't have them for semester, so sometimes their teachers um, might take a different perspective or had different assignments, etc. Um, so it's a really great time to be able to get to know them really quickly and what information they learned for semester. Um, so we talked about social and racial things that we had learned about. Um, they brainstormed it. They talked about it. They came up with some icons. And then they got a choice. Uh, the NEA gave them an option to draw, write, speak. Um, and then we got to submit it to a worldwide of students who also did the same thing. Um, KNEA awarded 10 scholarships this year. Six of them came from Garden City High School. Um, Garden City High School has never had a winner before. Um, so to have six in the very same year just shows how amazing our children are. Um, also, they, uh, they, we don't know their scholarship amounts. They wanted to keep it kind of private. Um, so that we celebrate the work and the art that they did versus the scholarship amount they get. So when they get it, they'll know themselves. Um, so I would like to introduce you to I-506, Zara Young, who actually made the cover of the KNEA. We gave everyone a laminated copy. Um, she's not with us today, um, but hers was about indigenous rights. Um, and so that's the, she actually hand drew that and it was scanned in. Um, but I'll let each one of them introduce you, and they're going to tell you a little bit about their art, and if you have questions, that's for them. 
<laughs> they're really mad. I like you to know that two of them came over from a soccer game today and have been waiting in the hallway, so they're exhausted. One of them came from tennis. He's also exhausted, and they all don't want to public speak. But I happen to know their speech teacher, so they may get extra credit for that. <laughs> Um, my name is Reese Kraus, and uh, my piece of art was like about littering and stuff because uh, my family has a ranch south of Garden City and um, out by Pie Mill, actually. And, uh, <laughs> I just noticed all the trash and stuff. My name's Angelina Garcia, and I did mine over recognizing the importance of disability rights and healthcare access. So do you want to explain like what I do? So uh, yeah, I just did like a pathway of different kinds of people in need like with disabilities and just like with a big bright pathway. So like it's like letting you know you're all welcomed. And the reason why I got the idea is because of my cousin who has cerebral palsy and I, growing up I've always knew that. He wasn't treated the way he should be, and yeah, gave me the idea to do that. Um, I'm Joey Wayne, and um, I drew a piece of basically like a person standing up in front of a mirror, and like they're basically like a bland slate, and you you like it's up to an interpret interpretation of who they were, because basically my piece was about like how. Like, despite, like, where you're from, even if society doesn't, like, accept you, there's still a community of people. No matter your, like, skin color, your orientation, your gender, there's still people that are going to accept you for, like, who you are, and you're seen and loved, and that was basically my piece. Hi, my name's Mia Terrazas. Um, she won know. today, by the way, just in case you want to know. Go Bucks. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know Tidwell. You guys do. You guys know he's an amazing speaker, and he gave me a voice. He allowed me to learn how to express myself, so I did spoken word. Um, it wasn't my story, but I did my sto I did a story on immigration rights. It was for my mother, and I talked about how her um, her story. If you ever want to hear it, um, if you want to hear an immigrant mother, a single mother story, I recommend you hear my piece. Um, it talks about all the issues she faced, um, all the issues, all the issues other women other women can face. And I just really, like, advise you to listen to my piece because I can't really describe it until you hear it yourself and then you allow yourself to see it the way it is. So I just, like, recommend you kind of take, like, four minutes out of your life and hear my voice and hear my story. Um, so my name is Athena Valdez, and my piece was about... Uh, a body part that looks like it has a different scar and it looks like it's being almost torn, part stitched back together. And it talks about, uh, well, but uh, it kind of shows how people will pick themselves apart to try to fit in or make themselves look better when they really shouldn't be doing that. They should be not trying to fit in and not pick themselves apart for other people. <laughs> What I love about all six pieces that were picked, it was by a blind pick, so they didn't know where they came from or what their names were, which is amazing that six of ours, we've got the best students in Kansas, we know that. Um, but is that it really represented the diversity of garden. It went from local farm town rural um, being you know, worried about industrialization all the way to um, women's rights, progressivism, um, and things like that. So I'm super proud of them, and I hope you are too. <laughs> Any questions for the children specifically? I would love it. So where, where did the pieces go to to be judged or picked? Yeah, so they it was an online submission. So anything that was like um, Athena's was digital spoken word, we had to record on a special like, MP4 to make sure it, get, it got there and that you can hear it. On the back of your pamphlets is the way you can scan it. And I know Josh said that he included the link. They're forever available on the KE website. Um, this is a yearly thing. 2020 kind of bogged it down, but it has been available for four years. Um, and then digital submission, I had to enter my phone number 154 times. So every student submitted something, um, whatever it was. Any more questions?
I just want to thank you guys for, for, for doing what you've done and taking the time and putting the hard work to put these together. Uh, you all did really uh, great pieces of work. Uh, I just thank you for that. No. Well, thank you for coming and speaking. It's it's hard for us and we're grown ups. So kudos to you. Did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to congratulate you as well. Wouldn't say six of the ten scholarships come to Garden City. So come to Garden. Great work by you and the and the teaching staff. So I appreciate that. I'd like to get a photo with the board and the students if we could. Yeah. I'd like you to know they really smell. <laughs> My feet. My feet. <laughs> Or they get to drink, so they got to stay white. Yeah. Oh, so they probably need to be in the front of the Yeah. They should a little bit more. Ready? One, two, three. One, two, three. Thank you. Great jobs. Good job. There was one left, and I gave it to them. Spreading the love. And it's hard. No, it's We're getting set up. Good evening. My name is Brian Cott. I'm the principal at Georgia Matthews. I have Becky Alexander here with me. She's our kindergarten teacher. She's been there quite a bit. Um, we've got some students here that uh, will actually have them introduce themselves as they go through uh, the beginning of the presentation. So, here we go. Right. Eli, you're up, bud. Hello, my name is Eli. My favorite subject is writing and I've been at Georgia Matthews for four years and with the staff members, all the staff, and my favorite activity, I mean, yes, my favorite activity is going to the felt party. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Alondra. I've been at Georgia Matthews for four years. My favorite staff member is all the staff members, and my favorite activity was the field trip to the movies. And my name is Maria. My favorite subject is I've been at Georgia Matthews for four years. These guys are all third graders um, at our building. Um, and they'll answer any questions if you have any questions right now, and then we'll help them kind of step out. I think your first question should be that I taught all of them, and I am not one of their favorites. <laughs> Remember building the videos, I'm like, hello. <laughs> hello. Have any questions for them? What's your favorite part of the day at school? Today? Say recent. Recent. Yeah. No, it's fine. It's fine. Recent. Fun. Anything coming, fun. You know? Yeah? 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 
Actually, guys, do you want to go through and shake the board members' hands? Shake their hands. Thank you. Hi, sweetheart. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Guys, want the pin? Come here. Either have a buffalo or it's Thank you. We got pictures, so it's. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Take a picture. Right here. Right here. Right there in front of the Good deal. It is. All right. Ready? One, two, three. One, two, three. All right. Good job. Thanks, man. Thank Kind of a little bit more about our building makeup is right now we have 130 students. Um, typically, we've been a one track school. Uh, this year, we have a, another second grade kind of due to the overflow and transfers of buildings being filled up. Part of our makeup, we have 22% of our student population is special ed, which nine of that percent is we also house the district behavior program, uh, which we take kids that are usually on track. Um, academically, uh, but do have some social skills uh, deficiencies. So part of our program will really works with building those social skills so they'll be successful um, in the buildings as they move up. Uh, typically, most of those times, those kids come to us as kindergartners through second grade, and they stay in our building um, all four years and then move on to sits or stones. Um, right now, too, along with our building, we're over 60% ESL. Um, kind of the makeup of our teaching staff. Uh, this year we had kind of high turnover. Um, we have six certified teachers and three long-term subs, subs starting out the year. Um, by the second semester, we ended up, one of those um, teachers was also a student teacher, ended up getting certified. Uh, so we moved to seven teachers and now we have one advanced student teacher. Uh, so she's doing her student teaching now. And then we have a one long-term sub, but she's in the transition to teaching programs in our building. Uh, academically, our goals for the building, uh, we're looking at 85% of our kindergarten students meet benchmark in the early, early reading um, composite of our fast bridge testing. And first through third grades, we're trying to get 80% of our students to meet phonics and fluency goals, or 80% of them meet benchmark um, through our teaching. And then our second goal is third and fourth grade, uh, looking at 10% increase of students that reach level three and four on the CAP assessment, which we finished last week. Kindergarten is gonna meet that goal. That's what I'm gonna ask. Um, <laughs> So this is where we're kind of at right now with our fast bridge testing. We still have the spring testing to go. Um, one of the big things with our behavior program and kind of program we've implemented in our school is looking at student growth um, as a huge goal. It may not be meet, meeting the benchmark score, but we really emphasize growth, growth in all aspects from behavior to academics. So right now um, in phonics and fluency and early reading, if you look at it, we're pretty excited about it. 97% of, or 95% of our kindergartners are showing growth. And that could be from one point to 50 points, which majority of our kindergartners are showing quite a bit of growth, which Becky can talk about um, if she has any more to add. Right now, first grade, same with our first grade, that's kind of our highest percentage of special ed students. Um, kind of in there, almost half that class is identified with an IEP. Um, but they're looking at about 81% growth in their academics and reading. Um, second grade, 83%. Third grade, um, which was the class that we had present, 91% of those students 
um, is showing growth, which that class two, we've kind of had a transition of teachers. We started with long-term sub, then we ended up, that teacher decided to leave. So we had two or three um, subs in between and then start a second semester. We ended up getting that transition to teaching sub. Um, so they've really exploded on growth um, with that consistency. Fourth grade is actually kind of been our highest class coming into the year. Um, so 71% of those students are showing growth as well. <laughs> Next one, it's our math, um, kind of where we're at benchmark, which, um, again, you look at the growth it is all our classes are ex uh, growing pretty rapidly. And there are large amounts of growth um, comparative to the, the reading scores. Um, and I'll go through that quick. Kindergarten, 100% of the students are showing growth. First grade, 81%. Second grade, 84 Third grade, 70 percent and fourth grade again which was our highest coming in uh, 57 percent of those kids um, showing growth uh, we are a leader in me school this is our first year of implementation of leader in me um, it, it we we kind of tie it in with what we're doing with our behavior program behavior plans um, and a lot of the things that we're already doing uh, we've started um, they have what's called lighthouse teams um, we're starting to get those organized in meeting, which basically the staff breaks up certified, classified into three different groups and looks at uh, different areas of the building to show improvement. So like one's culture, one's academics, and one's leadership. Um, so they break that down into those three areas, and each one focuses on how to improve that um, area. And they're kind of broken down with what's called an MRA, which is a survey that we gave to parents, all our staff, and um, third and fourth grade students this year. Uh, this past week, we had a music concert, and we actually did kind of a family events type thing with Leader and me talking about the seven habits. Um, we had about 84% of our student population's families come and take part in some of those activities. Uh, so we were pretty excited about that. Tell them why. Uh, part. part of why we got so many too is we challenged the kids. If 80% of their class came, they got to pie their teacher in the face. So we're looking at doing that. Who, who challenged? I, I challenged the kids. The teachers were, I guess, accepting. So, <laughs> and then the other part you is yourself. I, no, I, I said if 80% of the building came, that I and the counselor would get pied in the face. And if 90%, Everybody, all the classified, we didn't quite get to 90, but we um, did get to 80. We get to 80, so I get pied in the face, and then so does our counselor. So, um, we'll end up letting those students probably look at doing that next week. Um, if they came, and like I said, part of our building, and it's kind of a big part of our building, is the behavior program. I kind of went over what it is building the social skills. Um, right now, one of our big driving factors is Ms. Kitch, who has kind of started that program along with Becky, who's been in that building since the program even started. So it's working on those social skills. All those students are completely mainstreamed, um, so they spend most of their time in the classroom. They do have pair support, um, but we do pull out, which a lot of times in other buildings, those kids would be solely isolated in a special ed building. Um, right now I can say with having those students, um, we have sent a kid home behavior wise for a total, um, it's two or three kids of a day. Um, so that's one of the things that we pride ourselves on too is trying to handle our behavior in house, um, working with them, working on correcting those behaviors uh, so that we can see the growth um, instead of sending those kids home. Because a lot of times the kids go home, they play video games, their parents aren't there, um, and they're not getting the work done. So um, I, I really want to credit our staff for taking that approach too. Um, they really work hard to correct the behavior. They help each other out, classified and certified. Uh, so if we do have a kid that's not regulated um, and it's starting to get on the teacher's nerves, we've kind of set the culture where a teacher or a para or whoever's in the proximity could actually say, for example, like Miss Alexander, I'll take care of it. You go deal with your other kids. So it doesn't escalate the problem even more. Um, so it, it's really helped our building. 
uh, take that approach where classified staff do feel empowered they can do that. So a lot of times I've seen where classified staff just kind of steps back. Um, so, I mean, talk a little bit more. I would say the thing about that is we are taking the toughest kids in the district from schools that are, they are suspending them frequently. Um, and we are taking them and we are having success. Um, I have three in my classroom, four kind of, um, that were not slated to come to me. And my data still looks the same. They are making growth. They are reaching their benchmarks. And that is because we have been given the training and Ms. Kitch has been able to give us the training as teachers in the classroom to um, handle those behaviors and how to work with those kids and to meet them where they are. So once we get that under control, we are able to then help them academically. And that is where um, we're seeing them fail out at their home schools. So they come to us, we keep them. Um, we like to transition them out of the program if we can but they stay within our school so we can give them a regular setting um, without that support and test that out before we send them back. Uh, we have a few, all of our parents, I think it's all, that have had kids in that program that speak very highly of it. They don't want their kids to leave our school because the culture is different. <laughs> your child is accepted um, at our school. They are not... Um, separate and the kids we've created a culture where the kids also are accepting and including of them and forgiving of the things that are going on and we teach them that we all have our own things and we just have to love each other and accept that and try to understand how we can help each other um, deal with anything that we have going on so I think the training that we've been given allows us to have that uh, mindset and effect on those kids. And I would like to see that training for other teachers in the district because I think classroom management and behavior is not gonna go away and we've found a way to handle it. And we found a way to give them a positive school experience in the normal setting. So. And I think even with that training, it's also really showed with the turnover in staff. Like I said, we have one that's a brand new teacher at Christmas, one student teacher, and then one transitioning that, that has really benefited from uh, that in-building training, um, kind of taken it um, completely in stride and, and have really run with kind of those philosophies, which a lot of times new teachers struggle a little bit um, with classroom management, especially with some of those kids, um, because some are, when they come in, are are pretty rough uh, behavior-wise. Um, but with that extra training, I know like Dr. Scott that the district brought in this last year, um, a lot of that stuff actually building-wise has already kind of been done. Um, it was kind of the focus that we were looking at it from how do we transition kids out of the program um, which we actually do have one kindergartner that we're looking at transitioning out um, for next year um, and seeing how we can work to get them ideally back in their home building. Um, but I, I, we still think that we want to have that support as they transition out. So if they do have that fallback, um, they still feel success instead of going back to their home building where they don't have that extra support. And then all of a sudden, the next thing they're getting suspended again and, and we're kind of losing ground. So we're kind of working on trying to figure that out. And that's kind of where, like Becky said, is working with that other training, um, not only with our staff, but hopefully um, other staff. And I know like Ms. Kitch has been doing some of those trainings as well uh, every Monday night, which she does get um, sporadic numbers from outside of the building. I know she has some regulars that come, but they're they're starting to have more and more staff will come to those. Um, a little bit more about our building too is we like to celebrate um, kind of the successes and some of the activities that we do in, in our classrooms as well. Um, some of the pictures that we have it is like one of the classes is our second grade class in science is making, learning how to make ice cream in the science class and the science that goes behind that. Um, um, these pictures 
the fourth grade class is working on benchmark. They did a lesson on Mount Vesuvius, which benchmark is the English program. Um, so they're in there writing papers about Mount Vesuvius and drawing volcanoes and learning about volcanoes. Um, the other picture is we took part in the eclipse as a building. Um, so we had the whole building out, um, able to go observe the eclipse. Yeah, that's your reading oh, buddy. So this um, first picture is our reading buddies from Horace Good. They come every other week to read with us and spend time with us and do special projects in our kindergarten room. Um, and then some um, guests that we had for Read Across America Week. Which Dr. Dominguez took part in that too and read to our kindergartners and is very popular in that room now. <laughs> But Josh challenged them because Josh came and subbed. And now, Dr. D, there's a little bit of who do they want back more. So, <laughs> um, just some more pictures of those same things. Um, the bottom one. Uh, the bottom one is, I believe, our students also in fourth grade uh, was doing a, a lesson on the Oregon and Trail. So they're building, they kind of did a, uh, a live Oregon Trail game where they had to get supplies and then build a wagon and it worked on kind of communication and teamwork where there was only one person that was able to go get the supplies, but they had to communicate. There was only a certain number of things. So uh, just she, our fourth grade teacher does a great job of tying um, things in with reading lessons. So not only is it just reading and writing, but she kind of makes it fun as well. Along with our, some of those activities, again, celebrating some of our stuff. Um, this is the 100th day of school, um, movie nights. We have more Read Across America. We have a winter Valentine carnival. Um, so just more celebrations, making our kids know what they're working for, but then are being celebrated when they reach their goals. Um, our kids are very aware of their goals. Um, that's part of Leader and Me, but we were doing that before Leader and Me as well. Um, and so it's very much part of our culture that they know what they're striving for and where they're trying to get. They understand that we're all getting to different places, um, but then also celebrating together when we get there. And the last slide is just some more of those celebrations. Again, um, our students took part in the Spelling Bee. Uh, we did have a Christmas carnival where we had a lot of arts and crafts and other activities. Um, another couple pictures from the Valentine's Day Carnival and then our first grade with the 100 day of school. Kind of 101. Or 101. She did 101, sorry. Um, do you guys have any questions for, for us? I have some questions about the training, but you kind of work in those. Um, do you do anything special with the parents to try to help with in the behavior program so that there's consistency between school and home or? Uh, Ms. Kitch does a ton of communication with her parents. I know she talks about every day our kids have a, kind of a behavior plan or a checklist uh, that all the teachers kind of track behavior and they, they carry a clipboard everywhere. So it's not only a tool for parents, but also a discussion for the kids kind of another all across the school. Um, our kids understand the language, happy, straight, or sad, happy, they're doing well, straight is uh, maybe a, a kid has a certain number of redirects and they're getting close to where it ends up turning into uh, a sad. Um, and a lot of times our kids even call each other out, is that happy, is that sad? Um, and then on the back, she'll write a blurb on on if someone didn't do well or got a sad, they'll leave the explanation. Um, she does talk, like I said, with her parents pretty frequently about working with consequences at school and at home so the kids aren't getting hammered twice, um, but how she works, again, extremely well to, to build that communication. I think the parents appreciate from the get-go coming into the program. Um, lots of times they have heard nothing positive about their child. Um, it is a clean slate from day one, um, and we lead with 
positivity so that when we do have to have those conversations, because they're going to come, they're in the program for a reason. They come daily, sometimes multiple times a day. Um, and so that communication is there. We keep very good data. Her data tracking is amazing, and she can tell you exactly where they are, how many bad days they've had, how many good days that we can pinpoint down to the, hey, it's lunch. Lunch is what's blowing him up. What can we change about lunch to help accommodate him so that his afternoon is better? So I think once parents can see that we have that much information and we're putting that much effort into their child and trying to help them have a successful day at school, um, they get on board pretty quickly. And like I said earlier, our parents don't want to leave. When we have to have those conversations about it may be transition time, they're very hard. They don't want to go um, back to their home schools because they finally feel like their child's having success. And I know um, some of that conversation that we've had with some of our parents this year has actually kind of eased it. Um, I know Charles Stones is kind of trying to do the same type of program there with fifth and sixth grade. So um, part of that, as I know, their special ed teacher has been working with Ms. Kitch quite a bit. Um, so a lot of our verbiage transfers over to what they're doing there. Um, so there's a lot of similarities, which I know in a few of the transition meetings I've been in, um, parents have been very relieved um, instead of thinking that they're going to leave the building and it's all going to fall apart, um, just having those conversations. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, I move that we approve the consent agenda as we have. Second. 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 that we approve the consent agenda as amended. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Move on to unfinished business. Board of Education is asked to consider and approve a uh, design by ICE Engineers for AP. Um, I don't know that I have any more to share with you all. I think, Andy, I know you've been in contact with Shane, so you might have more to share on this topic than, than me, but I know, I know there was quite a bit of questions that had gone back and forth um, between you and, and Shane as far as what that looks like. So if you you might want to share. Uh, sure. I mean, so after the initial presentation, I mean, the questions I had was uh, <clears throat> what we had spent on design um, to design the VRF system, which is the the option, one of the options for a new mechanical system. Uh, what we had previously already spent to get that design done, because that design, my understanding, is done uh, to where we could just rebid that project and move forward with it. Um, ask for construction, uh, anticipated construction budget, like all in construction budget for the VRF system for that building, as well as for the four pipe system. And then an idea of what the, uh, the IRA rebate would be on that. And as I did the math and, and came up with those, they add up to be really, really similar in cost. I, you know, taking doing the math, I come up with uh, basically two million one fifty seven for a four pipe system. Uh, but if we went with the VRF system, it'd be about two million one twenty nine. So very, very similar. Um, uh, the, my la follow up question to them, to, to Shane and ultimately to mechanical engineers was, what are we looking at as projected utility costs with those two? Because I mean, with with those project costs being like being so close together, I think we need to really dive deep and understand what we're going to see for utility bills or projected utility bills, utilizing one system over the other to help us kind of get a full life life cycle uh, expect costs of, of either one of those systems. Um, I'd like to see that kind of worked out and brought back to us before we make this decision. I mean, 
Because where we are at right now is we, we've paid $129,000 to have a VRF system designed for that building. Um, to put that aside and design a four pipe system um, may be the right direction for us, but I think there's more data we should be, we should, should uh, run out before we make that choice. So. My understanding talking to Shane, because I asked him about that, my understanding was that we're not going to really know what that looks like until we get the design for the four pipe system, because then we'll know specifically what equipment's going to go in there after we, after we get the design is, is what he explained to me. I, I'm not a mechanical, mechanical engineer, um, but I, I suspect they could probably run some projections without having equipment picked and that sort of thing. I, I think there, I think that could be some data could be put together for us here in a couple. So I go back and ask that question to the planning team. My suggestion to the board is we table this. We ask for information on uh, anticipated annual utility costs, both on the gas and the electric side, uh, and see what those numbers look like before we make a choice. Here. I'm kind of with you, Andy, and I appreciate you including me in the email chain. And uh, I was able to read along. It's an area I'm not familiar with, so I uh, appreciate your expertise in this area and asking the questions to make sure that we're, we're spending, spending our money wisely and doing our due diligence um, before we just sign off on something. Any other motions to table? No. I would make a motion to table this until we get the information that Andy has requested. I'll second. I move and seconded that we table the ICE engineers uh, design fee until we get more information. Is there any more discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, same thing. Thank you, Josh. Yep. Uh, we'll move on to new business. Um, the City of Garden City projected growth and presentation. Matt Allen. The nature of the request is to Follow up on the letter that uh, we provided uh, Dr. Dominguez and the board boundary committee. Uh, in follow up to uh, school district staff reaching out to us, maybe 10 days ago or so, uh, and us getting together, having a meeting, following that up with a letter with information that the group, both your staff and, and those involved. Uh, on city staff and economic development corporation staff wise uh, thought might be helpful to you all uh, and then subsequently another follow-up zoom call with the uh, the firm that's been hired to work with the boundary study committee so um, by more than anything i'll stand for questions but a quick overview of the material in the letter i don't know how widely distributed that's been uh the Their research, this other firm's research is on student data, and we don't necessarily want to get into student data. That's not our bailiwick. Uh, however, the calls that we received were, hey, we think this information paints a little bit different picture about the community than what we're hearing in conversations with the city level, county level, economic development corporation level. So uh, I get that there's there, there, there could be a difference. I'm not going to speak to the student things. I don't feel like I'm equipped to do that, but I can tell you about how we projects that are that are in the works uh, the attached map to that memo shows uh, not just the number of projects which we believe to be imminent in the next three years uh, but also where those land geographically uh, more than just the aggregate number of homes which there's about a thousand on that page Certainly if you're doing a boundary study you want to know where those are at not just that there's a thousand uh, so we tried to 
uh, I'll give you a picture graph of where those where those land as best we could. Um, we also uh, would invite you to ask Lana questions. I think she'd be more appropriate to answer them than me. Some of these projects have advanced phases to them. Um, we aren't including that count. Uh, some of uh, there are other projects in the pipeline with other developers, and you know we're we're not including those in that count. But uh, those those account for upwards of uh, five thousand plus units. Uh, the commission has an articulated goal by 2030 to uh, produce 4,000 housing units. Uh, that was a goal set two years ago, I believe. Um, and while I don't think we're on a straight line pace to that, I do think we uh, think there's enough development in the queue that if uh, a good percentage of those come through, uh, We'll be well on our way to that number. If we fail by 50%, 2,000 units is pretty significant. That's building Ulysses and putting it on top of uh, what's already here in Garden City. So uh, lots of development, particularly uh, located to the north and to the east and to the northeast. Why to the north and to the east and to the northeast? Well, the industrial area to the west of the town is pretty well built out. There's a uh, there's not an impossible infrastructure project, but certainly at the t uh, for the last three decades of cost prohibitive infrastructure project to extend water and sewer utilities uh, across across the river or create separate districts south of the river. At some point in time, we'll, the Garden City uh, or Finney County, the Finney County area, uh, have to address that for growth. Maybe so, uh, but for now, uh, plenty of opportunity to, in a more affordable fashion, grow to the what's already undeveloped land inside the uh, what we call the bypass. It's no longer a bypass, really. And but the but then also to follow the track of the 2005 State of Kansas Department of Transportation study for the uh, for the real bypass, the 400 route bypass, which would uh, offshoot uh, at about Third Street to the northeast, loop around and join up. Again, with uh, Highway 50 West and 400 Route West, uh, just north of the airport. Um, we present annually, annually, I think we've missed a couple of years, to this board. We were here a couple months ago. We showed you most of these active projects, not all of them that are on this picture, uh, but I would say 800 of them are rep were represented in the presentation that we showed this group. Um, of course, many of you are active in other uh, parts of the community too, whether the Chamber of Commerce or city advisory boards and committees and um, housing or the development uh, trajectory of this community is, is, is talked about pretty frequently uh, in those circles of, as well. So um, I'm probably not telling you anything you don't already know, just maybe giving you a picture in more detail of where those are located. And if you've got questions for me or want to work. Thank you. Thanks for the answer. There's an apartment complex that accounts for around 200 units that I would say is the one project that uh, could have maybe been, it's on the property associated with the Sports of the World project. It maybe could have been in those uh, future after three years, we included it because they made a public application for MIH as a developer. They own the property. It's not just somebody that owns some park ground and says, "Well, I might like to transition out of farm and maybe build a house or two on this property." And this is there's a level of seriousness to develop that. Uh, it's just whether or not it happens in that three year time frame. The other units on this, I would say, barring uh, something extraordinary happening on in the community or happening on their end of the equation, all those developments are going to move forward. Are interest rates delayed some of this in your opinion or no? Yeah, interest rates are a, a, a variable. Uh, development costs are a variable. Steel cost goes up, wood goes up. I mean, there, there's always an, uh, a reason for a delay and every project at some point in time runs into it. 
most of these are still moving forward and under construction. I mean, it's not pretend they're going vertical. We ran into more delays with. Sidelines, partnerships. I don't know if I can speak for the rest of the board, but it's just, it's, uh, I guess there's two, there's kind of two ends of the spectrum that we're getting presented. You know, a little bit RSP is telling us, hey, you know, our enrollment's going to decline and, you know, it's going to continue to decline. And obviously the city's saying, hey, we're, growing and we're going to get more housing units and we're going to get more people here. Um, I just wish I knew exactly where, yeah. the, where those two were going to come together. Good luck reconciling that. Yeah. 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 Well, it's the hard part when we sit on this side of the table. And it's certainly not in my interest to discredit them. I, we spent a long time on a Zoom call uh, with them and I felt I spent a lot of time hearing them defend their process. Look, it's it, it's worked for them. I understand that they've got a formulaic approach that they apply equally to their di districts. I, I mean, we work with consultants too. And, uh, we work with consultants for developers that develop things and use kind of ESRI data, uh, you know, census data, those types of things. And they look at that information and say, no, if we can't bring our store to Garden City. We won't make any money. You guys aren't growing. And then we've got others that come to the community and say, hey, there's a lot going on here. Maybe we should try that. We'll build a small footprint store. And six months after they open up, they go, why did we build the small footprint store? We should have built the full thing. It's the most successful store in our fleet. So, you know, is this the same thing? I don't know. I mean, you'll have to look around the community and figure out, you know, what, I think there was an attempt to kind of reconcile the two stories. I, I believe the district may have pulled us some data that you may have to understand as is the nature of the is the demographic nature of the students uh, the census variable tell us anything if we drill down deep into that that may be different than if I'm doing this study in Jackson County Missouri or uh, you know El Dorado or Greater Oklahoma City I mean I, I don't know uh, again our job isn't to discredit that our job is to uh, period of time, I'd say over four decades, it's been the desire across all the public boards of this community to do so. Um, we're building units right now, two units would average one child in the school district based on what you've got right now. So even after the decline, two units seems to translate into one student. Half a student, but we choose to do two doors and one student because half a student seems kind of gravity. But, the, but you would, uh, if you only, if we only build the thousand units that we put in the memo and we don't build anything else after that, it seems to be 500 students. Um, if you follow RSV and the trend line, it would mean another. It would be losing more students, and I don't, you know, I can't get that to reconcile that we build a thousand more units and actually lose more students. Uh, they would, new homes would make students disappear. I, 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 I don't get that. Um, my comment, my, my comment here isn't really a question necessarily specifically to you, but just kind of more of a comment in general about where we're at and what we've got to do. Obviously, we heard a lot of a lot of really important feedback tonight. Um, you know, where we're at, we're, we're just kind of on the cusp of diving into these things, diving into this data. Uh, we're getting feedback from the committee is what I believe, you know, the, to hear what the community wants to see the future of our school districts. Uh, with those kind of overarching recommendations, we've then got to figure out what that means for our us as a building. Um, there is a lot of data to reconcile. I mean, 
at least according to the information that came from RSP, over the last 10 years, we've had over 420 single family homes built and 217 multifamily units built, but our enrollment has dropped 700 students over that same time. Um, RSP's data is also telling us that uh, every single family home, basically for every 100 single family homes, I think yields 20 students in our district. And for every multifamily unit, uh, 100 units, it yields between 50 and 55 students, if I'm interpreting the information from RSP correctly. Um, what I hope we can do working, moving forward is um, to, can, to work with the city, work with any kind of economic development and with RSP. And ultimately, we've got to try to make decisions about what's the right size uh, of our, our buildings overall, student capacities, what does our future look like, what's the right size for now, what's our long-term strategic plan for the future. Um, so I, I appreciate you coming, Matt. I appreciate the information you guys have provided in the conversation so far. I, I just feel like we've got a lot more that we need to do together to try to understand these past numbers and what's that going to look like for us going forward. Because, I mean, the thing that I just seem to have a, I, I have the hardest time understanding is that is the growth we've seen over the last 10 years with development of these homes, the declining student population, you know, what, what's really trying to get to the bottom of what's, what's caused that trend and, and what about our future growth will, um, will change the trajectory of that. So I don't have any specific answer for you tonight. It's just kind of where I'm at with all this and, and trying to understand what we got to do and what, where we've got to dissect this information further. All right, thanks. Thank you, sir. All right, let's move on to item number I3, City of Garden City, 800 request. <laughs> I'm Mike Muirhead. I'm the Director of Public Works and Utilities for the City of Garden City. And I believe uh, Dr. Dominguez says you guys have the easement request that you have it in your packet there, so I won't belabor all of that. I'm here to answer any questions you may have about that. The two easements that we're requesting, one is for a sanitary sewer extension, and the other one is for a water line extension. Both of those will be eight inch in diameter, uh, and it will serve that property that's just directly south uh, and east of both. Alpha High School and east of Buffalo Way. So we have the drawings and then the extension of one packet. Does anyone have any other questions for Mike? Nobody has any other questions for Mike. Do have an issue that we need to vote on this evening? Uh, the easement request to the city was not. This easement, Mike, would it, does that whole section it would be for? Or is it just specific? It would serve that entire section of property. So you know, the one, the developer that's there now, they've taken a portion of that. Uh, this would serve all of that. Uh, eventually, it would go tie into our system on the east side of the bypass. So we, but there's plans to extend it further and further as time goes on. So the sanitary sewer, the water line that's going to come down off of those loops around the high school right now, that would come down and it loops that entire piece of property, not just the one that the developers are talking about now. It would loop that whole thing. So for any kind of future development. How are uh, how are the uh, buildings on the east side of the bypass serve the sanitary sewer currently? How would they tie into How are they served currently? The buildings that are on the east side of the bypass, and I presume you're talking about the north side of Mary, how are sanitary fed to those already? The sanitary sewer that's on the... Uh, 
east side of the bypass. It's cleared down by uh, tractor supply. So eventually, if that all that develops up there, you know, north of tractor supply, and that sanitary sewer is going to have to come down into that system somewhere. It gets kind of complicated. We have a lift station over there. Uh, that all of that has to go into there. That all has to be taken into consideration. But for this particular easement that we're requesting, that would have no impact on any of that. I was just trying to give you kind of a picture of where it's going to go in the future, should that be. So what happens to that development if it doesn't, if we don't? We don't do it? Yeah. Easements would be gained from someone else, somewhere else. Again, we have to provide sanitary sewer and water to that piece of property. So one way or the other, we have to get it there. This is the easiest and most economical in the sort of sense of what the spec would be. Actually, the easement on the water line around the school not that it makes any difference because it's already there, but that was actually designed to be on the south side of the road. If that would have been the case, there's already an easement on that other piece, so we wouldn't have needed that, but that's neither here nor there. This is to serve uh, the plan of construction of the gas station. Well, the development that's planned is that's correct. It is that's, as far as I know. Uh, we we see people come in and want to put something in there, and they go through the whole process, and that never occurs too. So we just know we got to. But is that that's the current plan development for that property? Yeah, as far as I know, it is. Yes. Take a comment. I know obviously you're here in the interest of the city and, and we're sitting here in the interest of the, of the school, but I, I can't speak for the rest of the board, but just as a board member, um, I'm not super excited or thrilled about the you know the idea of having more traffic on West Lake Bay or having a business, you know, right there. But uh, I don't know if you spent much time at the entrance to the high school in the mornings going in and out. We're already pretty packed up, and the idea of more traffic coming in and out of there. I mean, things like this, I'm glad to see we can keep the traffic up there. We have this doesn't have anything to do with that. This is just easements to get to provide water and sewer to that piece of property. Uh, whatever gets developed there or anywhere else on a high impact area, they all have to do traffic impact studies to determine what needs to be done, if anything. Ron, I guess we'll need a motion.
that's like no way. But with that, we'll move on to uh, new business. Uh, I three, the Board of Education has asked to consider and approve a purchase for purchase of custodial equipment and state contract. Um, our, our maintenance staff um, last year they put together kind of a a seven year rotation. Uh, for some of their equipment, much of their equipment is um, in, in chain where it's old enough to vote. Um, so it's time to be retired and kind of update some of the equipment. They're spending a lot of the time um, repairing equipment and, and replacing a lot of a lot of parts on it. And so um, the uh, uh, the the memo that you have is to uh, to update some equipment. Um, so that they can they can uh, work on their cleaning, so um, vacuums and scrubbers and, and things like that. Total total bill for that is um, one hundred and four thousand uh, five hundred twenty six dollars and eighty six cents. They have the balances, and it's something that they budgeted for in their plan. On the memo, Josh, it says that you're in the seven year rotation, but it says we're in year two. Does that yeah, mean they started the rotation last year? Okay. Yeah, this is the second year. We approved both for the purchase of custodial equipment here to This is a state contract for $104,526.86. It's been moved and seconded that we approve and consider the quote for the purchase of the custodial equipment. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move on to board open discussion. want to echo what Andrew said. Um, obviously, by the number of people in this room today, we have a lot to think about. Um, and um, I said this, I'm on the Boundary Study Committee as well. And one of the things that really stuck out to me during that meeting after we looked at all the data was that the bottom of that data are people. And obviously tonight proved that. So um, I appreciate the people that came. It's tough speaking in public and uh, they're working out for us. But we're up to the task. I'll agree. That I appreciate all the comments and all the feedback. You know, I think we've all had many meetings with different people in the community. And so appreciate the openness and willingness to share ideas and it's also important that we keep looking at the bigger picture, and I appreciate that as far as we can go forward, um, making sure that we remember everybody's important and everybody's significant. So I appreciate all of those comments. All those things going on, I do appreciate the students being here and the recognitions and this, the positivity that the school is doing, great things from all the different departments in our school system. So appreciate that. Um, and definitely uh, congratulate all the students for all the excellent year uh, that we've had so far and looking forward to what's coming up here as we finish out the year strong. And I do appreciate the, the history of the schools and the passion that we see uh, for our school system. So I wanna really encourage that and continue that as we go forward. So. 
I appreciate the uh, input we received from, from folks tonight. Uh, I've lived in Guernsey City nearly 33 years, seen significant growth in this community in those 33 years. Uh, we have the RSP study on one end, we have the city on the other. Uh, somehow we have to reconcile that and, and figure out what we can do and what, what is best for the students uh, and, and the community as well. So, uh, again, appreciate the, 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 the folks taking the time to be here tonight. Uh, that presented to us in public comment as well as the city economic development and, and others. So we have a we have a monumental task in front of us. I think. I'd also like to thank everybody. Great to see everybody. So many times we have meetings and sometimes nobody pays attention. It was nice to have so many people here and you know, really show their investment. It's, uh, it's nice to see everybody. I, I'm always glad to see people take uh, take some ownership of their community and their schools. And I do. I, I wish it was full like that every night. Um, I appreciate it, and I appreciate the feedback. Yeah, I want to I want to say thank you specifically to the people who served on this boundary city committee. Um, this this originally started as as that. Uh, I think a group of about fifty people. Um, anywhere between like 30 to 40 people per per night at those um the conversation has evolved and what's and what's been asked to be considered by that group has evolved um i think when the topic of grade reconfiguration really came into that conversation uh, we expanded that process we, we added more meetings for that purpose um, but also what was asked of those community members has grown and, and their input and their thoughts that we're asking them to consider has grown. Um, when I'm personally uh, looking to get out of the boundaries, uh, out, we keep calling it a boundary study. Obviously, it's, it's more than that at this point. What I'm looking to get from that committee is, me personally, and I don't, I don't want to speak for the board or uh, and all, but is really a, a, an overarching view of where they'd like to see the district land, <laughs> what the future of USD 457 look like. Um, on every level, grade three configurations, members of middle schools, the ideas of potentially closing elementary schools and uh, in the near term and what the future might be long term. Um, but it's like a lot of people do tonight, there's a lot of uh, future analysis that has to come out of that after we get that direction from the committee, after they give us that guiding direction of where they want to see us. Uh, try to focus, uh, we've got a lot, I think, as a board to dissect and understand feasibility of uh, economically, um, facilities-wise, uh, to, to see where that's at. So um, there's a lot we have yet to even begin to wade into. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of discussions are still to be had. Uh, but I really, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the conversations we're going to have with folks on Wednesday and Thursday. It's public input. Um, and obviously, we're going to have it was we have a, a special meeting next week um, as a board to, to talk about that, and then we'll have one more committee meeting. Um, and so, I, I encourage people to come to these meetings on Wednesday and Thursday night. And every every single I've had a lot of conversations in the last month with folks, and every one of those conversation yields uh, at least you know one point of unique perspective. And so, I just encourage people to continue to keep engaging in this conversation and, 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 uh, and speaking to us about uh, things we need to be considering so before we can help us um, inform our decision for the future. Is that further than the five minutes there? Did I? <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Okay, uh, I want to thank the board because this is some really heavy lifting, a lot of uh, mental gymnastics that we're working with. I want to thank the city and the parents for coming in because we are a community. We're a growing community. We just got to uh, stay the course. Our high school students, six out of the 10 scholarships, that's amazing. George Matthews showing that we're doing well. Um, the <clears throat> meeting of note is April 17th and 18th. Make sure um, high school commons at 5.30 on both days. Uh, we'll do some table activity at the end of that. We'll definitely let you guys speak and speak your mind as far as that goes. And then we have a uh, board retreat on the 22nd also, that's Monday here at six to eight so uh, the board can discuss 
uh, a little bit of, of exactly what everybody had said, but Andy hit on it, that uh, the committee was a boundary study initially on the first meeting. The committee uh, was asked to the task, and that task has kind of evolved. So that will look a little different and trying to engage and rich empower everybody. It takes us all. So I'm very excited about still where we're going and um, yeah, we'll keep moving forward. Thank you. I would just agree with all the comments that were made. And uh, I would like to, I'd like to thank our staff as well. Um, I know we've gotten a lot more emails and a lot more requests um, from, the, from the public that's been sent to you and you've had to forward them to the board and to provide good communication for us. And I know that's extra work outside of your daily task. And then I also know as board members, we've been bombarding you guys with emails a little bit about, hey, tell me about this number or what's this gonna cost or what are we gonna save? And like, we're gonna start getting more, we're probably gonna start getting more of that as we get closer to, <laughs> to a decision. But I just wanna thank you guys in advance. I know this is kind of above and beyond the normal um, daily routine. Um, but I agree with Andy just from the standpoint, I mean, if, if the committee can bring us something, then, then we have to run through a lot of different traps and we're going to have to figure out if it's actually feasible, economically feasible. And uh, appreciate Matt coming in tonight. I mean, the last thing we want to do as a school district is send signals to potential uh, people that want to come and invest in our community that we're closing schools and, and, and we don't want to send that signal to them at all. Um, but at the same time, we have a district to run. And I think um, as we continue to lose students, obviously that affects our budget. So we have to make tough decisions when it comes to that as well. So I'm hoping that somewhere, you know, somewhere in the middle, we can we can kind of figure out where the truth is and 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 what's the best plan for the city moving forward. Because obviously we want the city to be successful and grow, and we want the school district to be successful and grow and provide the best education possible for the students in Garden City. And, and make it a great place to live and work and uh, just to do well. So I appreciate y'all's comments and I appreciate y'all's hard work. And I know we got a lot of hard work ahead of us. So appreciate y'all. Appreciate y'all and thank you in advance for, for that. Good night. Thank you. I just wanted to let you know that I still have a job and I have, I will not be here Wednesday and Thursday. I will be in Topeka. I'm not missing this on purpose. I would love to be there, but I have, I'm still getting paid to do something and I got to be there. So, so unfortunately, I will not be here Wednesday and Thursday. But I am looking forward to hearing from the other board members and, and, and community members the input that you receive at those evenings. Well, I appreciate that. Um, next board of education meeting will take place on May 6th. 2024 at 6 p.m. in the board meeting room and at the Educational Support Center at 1205 Green Street in Garden City. Mr. President, I move we go into executive session for 20 minutes to discuss negotiations for the 2024 school year. Pursuant to the exception of negotiations under Oma beginning at 8 15 p.m. and the open meeting will resume in the board meeting room at 8 35 p.m. I'd like to invite Dr. Dominguez, Josh Guyman, Drew Tone, and Jessica Nalbrin to join us in the executive session. Negotiations by Mr. Executive session for important negotiations. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All in favor, 